Joining us now to review some of the headlines of today's newspapers from around the world is our Rice News analyst, Vimbai Mutinghiri Ekweyong. Good morning, Vimbai. Good morning. Good it's morning, the morning show. TGIF. Yeah. <laughs> I hope everybody's ready for the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Last yeah, edition of the show one. this year. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. Great weekend, this exactly. One. great weekend ahead. Well, let's get straight into it. Let's find out what the newspapers are saying. As you've rightfully said, Rufai, it is the last working day of 2023, uh, but we're still pushing forward. We kick off, of course, with the newspaper of record. That is this day. This day uh, is leading with the good news, of course, that Dangote is a $20 billion refinery, gets third crude shipment, may start production in January, which is just the type of ne uh, news that we need to kick off a new year. Of course, we know how much reprieve this will provide to the market and uh, to general petroleum prices. So we're looking forward to that one. Above that, of course, is a story that you have already tracked in detail earlier on the morning show. Tinubu to Governor Aieda Tiwa. Take charge. Mobilize Ondo people to move the state forward. However, a conversation that has been dominant this week and that we need to continue to push forward is the issue of security. Now, this day is, uh, I believe, tackling the issue of security from a different angle. If we look above the masthead, the headline there is, despite Nigeria's 20 million out-of-school children crisis, states fail to access 68 billion UBEC fund. Why is this a security headline, in my opinion? Because illiteracy, of course, we know is a major concern contributor towards extremism. So the Universal Basic Education Commission uh, has been uh, approached by activists and, of course, uh, San, that's Femi Falana, who is saying that uh, he's quoting the UNICEF statistics for Nigeria's out-of-school children that are now at 20.2 million, the highest globally. And I quote, in its prompt reply to our letter, uh, the UBEC disclosed that the total unaccessed matching grant from all <coughs> states of the Federation and the FCT stood at 68 billion naira. This is money that's supposed to go towards educating our youth. State governments had failed to comply with Section 3 of the Education Reforms Act, which mandates them to contribute half or 50 percent of the total cost of projects to be executed in the state as their own commitment. Very, very difficult conversation to, to digest, but that is the state of education in the nation currently. We move over to the Nigerian Tribune, continuing a theme of security. Human lives seem to mean nothing anymore in Nigeria. That's a quote from Jamatu Nasril Islam, echoes again the conversation that was had this morning and that we've been having throughout this week. So in a statement shared by the Secretary General of the JNI, uh, he says, and I quote, they observed with dismay that the most recent attacks on the plateau were well orchestrated with perhaps ulterior motives to set the state on political and religious turmoil. So we continue to keep our eyes on how this issue will be handled, especially with fresh threats of attack uh, being, sh being uh, released by the terrorists and uh, concerns about how the situation is going to be managed. Bottom of the Nigerian Tribune, Ayeda Tiwa leads Ondo Exco members on condolence visit to Akere Dolu's widow in Ibadan. That takes me to the Punch newspaper. Uh, the punch, of course, is also uh, leading with invaders' right community threaten fresh attacks. UN demands probe. That's on the Plateau massacre. However, I would like to uh, look just above the masthead on the left-hand side there, where the punch leads with five of Akeredolu's men quit. Ayedatiwa's cabinet. Mm -hmm. Uh, governor shops for deputy. So uh, the punch has decided to do more of an analysis of what uh, what the chances are looking like for those who would be contending for the office of the deputy governor of Ondo State. So the governor is looking towards the north and central senatorial districts of the state. We know, of course, that the late Akira Dolu is from the north. So why the central senatorial district? Well, you remember the commissioner for energy and mineral resources, that's Razak Obe, who had flagged, raised concerns that the governor, the late governor, Kero Dolu's signature was being forged. So some are, some are saying, is it possible that uh, uh, the governor, Ayeda Tiwa, might use this opportunity to reward him and work with him? Or will he choose somebody from the north? Uh, people are, are, are putting forward the name of chief of staff to the former governor, Olubenga Ale, and saying, is it possible that... Uh, 
uh, the governor Ayed Datiwa will extend an olive branch to those loyal to Akere Dolu uh, and in the in the person of uh, somebody from the North Senatorial District uh, in order to move the state forward. Well, we stand to see, uh, we believe that decision will be made in the next few days. Of course, we look forward to the decision that he will come to. Now, very quickly to the Daily Sun. The Daily Sun is leading with the headline, Reps Move to Criminalize Salary Non-Payment. Yeah, the House of Reps is proposing a bill to criminalize delay and non-payment of salaries of employees by individuals and corporate bodies in the country. Uh, this is called the Employees Remuneration Bill. The bill has already passed the first reading. They're proposing three to six months imprisonment for defaulting employers. So there's a lot to dig in with that headline, a lot to unpack over there. Very, very quickly, let's go straight to uh, the business day. So I have chosen the business day this morning so that uh, we can round up our Nigerian headlines with some good news. The lead image there is from the Calabar Carnival. Of course, we know that this is a huge fixture on the annual Nigerian tourism calendar. This year's carnival was themed Season of Sweetness. We see the sea Girl Band, which of course uh, is the great project of Senator Florence Itagiwa um, uh, 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 leading their procession through the streets of Calabar. Uh, so congratulations to the governor of the state because this year for the first time in almost eight or nine years, all hotels in Calabar were fully booked. So it's good to have positive economic news from somewhere in the country uh, where we know that there's a lot of bad news elsewhere. It seems that tourism in Calabar, for now anyway, is being revived under the new uh, governorship of Prince Otu. So that's a very good, good one. Very quickly to the Washington Post. The Washington Post, uh, Trump is back to the front burner in the headlines globally. This time it's all about will he make it or will he not make it to the primaries. Uh, we know that Colorado barred him from the primary ballot. Now Maine has hopped on the bandwagon as well. So the Washington Post is leading with that story. And then very quickly to the Times of London. Uh, for a story I thought was quite interesting, uh, especially because just now we spoke about uh, uh, laws that might be implemented or rather that are in discussion in Nigeria about what to do with uh, late salary payers. This one says civil service beats wage freeze by over promoting. So the gist of the story is that uh, Whitehall staff are being moved into senior jobs before they are ready in order to circumvent a pay squeeze. We know that uh, the UK is currently experiencing quite an economic crunch. Uh, so there is a pay freeze squeezing um, the government's ability to increase civil servant salaries. Now, get this. This report went into detail about morale scores. So they're saying that morale scores within civil service has dropped. Cabinet office uh, has now overtaken the home office to become the most miserable department to work in in the UK. But I found it to be pretty profound, shall I say, that we're keeping track of the morale of our civil servants uh, in the UK. A conversation I, I'm pretty sure civil servants in not just in Nigeria, but across Africa would also like to have and have the consideration mm. of their morale. But let's bring the conversation uh, back into the studio. Okay. Uh, since it's Friday, ladies first. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 I love how, um, let me, starting from the foreign scene, um, the UK in particular pays close attention to its civil servants. They, they, they're just coming out of um, a cost of living crisis. I don't think they've completely come out of that. And we've talked about how hard biting it has been on the citizens. And you can imagine that on civil servants as well. So there has had to be a wage freeze. However, beyond the wage freeze, it's also looking at the welfare. There have been also other, um, let me use the word that's famous in Nigeria, palliatives, so cushioning the effect on workers, especially during the first two seasons. So I think that's important to highlight side by side. Our own, earlier today, I talked about uh, people in Nondo State who need to have their wages paid, gratuities and pensions for retired um, staff members and other states of Nigeria where, unfortunately, they've had to get, like, they've had to just been paid a percentage. I am up for the employee, what's the, the, the bill about um, three to The six employee's months. remuneration bill. Remuneration bill. bill. I hope it will be passed because, we've been, especially in the private sector, and to be honest, nobody, whether private or public sector, there's no justification for owing people who come to work. Being 
Mumbai, there are people who have not been paid for upwards of nine months in some mm. organizations. And there are some industries that are notorious, I will not mention, because there are some industries that are notorious for non-payment of staff salaries. And it just almost seems like the norm. No one says anything. No one is advocating for them. You wonder where, um, you know, NLC has a lot on their plates. I don't know. I mean, they advocate for that. But it's something that we need to actually put into law so that we can hold um, these employers to account. The reason is because some of them have the money to pay. But for some people, the reason why they don't pay salaries is just bad management. I hear of cases where, um, where it's a one-man business, he goes in, takes the money from the coffers, and then the employ employees are left with nothing at the end of the month. This has to be checked, and I do hope that bill will be passed. And finally, let me talk about you, Beck. And I love that you, you know, um, put that side by side and how it affects insurgency, terrorism. I talked about the fact that an idle, man, idle mind is the devil's word. Workshop. And I have to bring that phrase that Dr. Bassi says that they're tired of hearing kinetic and non kinetic approaches mm -hmm. <laughs> to tackling security because education is a non kinetic approach to tackling insecurity. If we're going to tackle insecurity in Nigeria, it must be holistic. It's not just about force and uh, you know, um, going in there with force, but train the people, educate them. Now, the reason given by UBEC as to why governors are not accessing this 64 billion naira in the fund, despite the fact that Nigeria has the largest out of school children in the world, is because they, don't, they cannot not give much funding. And then you begin to examine, and that's why we talk about the fact that when we look at the center, focus on the center, we forget the subnationals. Why are governments of, of states not able to match, um, to provide much funding for funds that's already available? So it's not just because UBEC doesn't want to release the funds, it is that the states don't have enough money or perhaps political will to actually provide much funding to be able to access the fund. And I don't think that the bill should be reviewed. I think that states should take responsibility for the education of its citizens. They need to be a bit more creative and put a bit more attention in the budget as to what they allocate in, in, in education. I'll rest with this. Enugu, Lagos State, or your state have been identified as some of the states that give you know, at least over 20% of their entire budget to education. The UNICEF, UNICEF recommended, I think it's about 27% of, um, of, the, of, of, the, of a country's annual budget to be able to adequately you know, um, provide for education. We need to hold our states more accountable. Let them not be lazy by just, okay, if it, if, if it means us providing much funding, then keep your money. Let them find the money if education is important enough to them. I mean, so I, I just want to jump on that because what you said is very critical. And it is a big shame on our states. Because you see there are some states that have over 20 billion for the office of the governor alone. Yep. And to provide counterpart funding for monies already provided, they will not do it because it's not priority to them. And it's a sad indication of our country. You can see the, the literacy numbers I think at a point we had something called Vision 2010. What happened to Vision 2010? We're supposed to have math literacy. I remember during the time of Abacha, the talk then, you, you, you listen to the news, Vision 2010, Vision 2010, Vision 2010. But the states are not ready to do, and they're always lazy. And these states are the ones incurring more debt. That's why I see, I have always advocated for federalism, where these states are made to be centers of creativity and excellence, where there's nothing in the central the federal, that they can. Because you see, I think that idea of monthly allocation has destroyed their thinking capacity. Anybody just wants to become governor because they want to go there and take monthly allocation, not creative thinking. Look at all of them. When you see the governors making this, yeah, 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 what's their IGR? They can't think, they can't create. Stinking thinking, it stinks. And when you have a fallback on the educational sector, you wonder what is happening. That's why Nigeria is now producing a large number of educated illiterates, illiterates, educated illiterates. Because you see, in Nigeria, it's not because you have a university degree that makes you sensible. A lot of them have university degrees. The quality is rubbish. The university degrees today cannot even be compared to primary five or standard, whatever they call it, back in the days of Awolowo. Awolowo did something that was unique. He used one third of his budget to provide free education. One third. One over three of his budget. That's what education meant to him. I still meet some people today. They say, me, okay, but more free education, Awolowo. So we don't have leaders that are forthright again. And that's a point we need to understand. We don't know. That's why you have mass problems. Just like the insecurity problem. When the Metisani riot happened in the 80s in this country, there was a panel of inquiry set up. The panel of inquiry said that if you don't educate the people, if you don't solve 
poverty problem in the north, you will have mass crisis. Since the early 80s, that panel report was that nobody did anything about it. Now the north is on fire, we are scampering, we never found solution. Secondly, the second one I would like to talk about is the case of Trump. Okay, from the Washington Post. And I think the Democrats, no, I'm not going to say the Democrats anyway, because it's, nothing, it's got nothing to, them, to do with them. It's just the legal system and the state systems that are picking up because America have hugely independent states like Colorado and Maine. But I think all of these things trying to drag Trump to that 14 Amendment thing that talked about insurrectionist, I think to a large extent is doing the Trump a service and he might eventually become president of America. At first it was Colorado. Anyway, his lawyers have said they're going to try to upturn this main one again, like they're going to go to the Supreme Court for the one in Colorado. I think it's already feeding into his base. And at a point where inflation uh, Americans still are complaining about inflation, although Biden has done some work as regards breaking it down. Also, Americans are complaining about the state of economy. Yes, Biden has done some work, don't get me wrong. But you see, I think somebody was asking, do feelings matter? The greatest expression of what is called politics is general mood and sentiment. A lot of Americans are tired. There's a general mood against Biden. So all of this might be playing to Trump's hand. So people that are pushing it could also watch it. In the space of trying to pop up Biden, they might be doing a disservice. As at a point, Trump and Biden were neck and neck in the poll. Today, Trump is already leading Biden in the polls. And he's already having a very, very, you know, it's narrow, but the margins are beginning to increase. So all of these court cases, with all the ones he's facing, might just be playing to his hands. And if care is not taken, we might see a Trump president, and you know what the Trump president is going to be. He's going to settle scores. Okay. <clears throat> On Trump. Yes, we have had, uh, you know, the courts in uh, New Hampshire, Michigan, and other places refusing uh, to go the way of Colorado and Maine. It's two states now. In the case of uh, Maine, the decision was taken by the Secretary of State, not by the uh, Superior Courts, not by the high courts in uh, Maine, but by the Secretary of State, uh, uh, Shena uh, Daros. And she says she's also, as the uh, Colorado Supreme Court decided, relying on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment Act, US Amend 14th Amendment Act of the US Constitution, referring to insurrection and penalties for it, involving a public officer. And, you know, what is being said is that that uh, act of rebellion, of assault on the Capitol on January 6, 2021, that it was inspired by uh, Donald Trump. However, Maine has four electoral college votes. Colorado has 10 electoral college votes. And in any case, these are Democrat-leaning states. The woman who took the decision in Maine, instructively, is a, is a Democrat. So you find that it's only in those democratic leading states that you find these decisions being taken, not in the whole of America. However, Trump remains the leading candidate for the, uh, for the Republican Party and is likely to be the one uh, to emerge. That's one. Two, the other story about UBEC that you've been discussing. The relevant section is Section 3 of the UBEC Act. Section 3 says the federal government provides grant and then the states provide a matching grant of 50%. And this is not a new problem. I recall that uh, Mr. Femi Falano, SAN, under the group that he, he led during the COVID period, ASCAP, had to issue a statement to say that, okay, the federal government, UBEC, should give the funds directly to the states and let us see what they do with it, instead of waiting for them to provide a matching grant. So the problem has been there before now who will address it, considering the fact that UNESCO says that there are over 20.2 million children out of school in Nigeria. And the objective of this UBEC Act is to ensure compulsory, free, universal, basic education. And then you find that between the federal government and the uh, state governments, they are breaking the law because to, 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 not to be able to find this concurrence amounts to breaking Section 3 of the uh, Enabling Act. That same law, the UBEC Act, another part of it that is not being implemented is that 
He prescribes penalties for parents that don't send their children to school. There are many parents in this country, in parts of the country, that are not sending their children to school that need to be sanctioned. Finally, I wanted to draw attention to his story, front page of the Daily Telegraph today, where, you know, the watchdog is saying that out of the 43 police forces in England and Wales, only 22 of them, you know, are doing anything. That half of them are doing nothing in terms of investigating crime or being able to tackle crime, which is instructive. Because only a few days ago, the head of the domestic unit of the Metropolitan Police was saying that, look, the public has lost confidence, trust, in the capacity of the Metropolitan Police to deal with domestic violence. I will have, now, what they want to do next year is to make sure that His Majesty's uh, Constabulary uh, uh, Unit investigates all of this. Do we have that kind of proper oversight over Nigeria's security forces, over, the, let us even start with the Nigerian police. Every time we just say the police is not doing well, the police is not doing well, but who, where is that oversight? Unfortunately, we don't have it. And when uh, the National Assembly steps in as the oversight unit, what you hear is we don't have vehicles, we don't have, but how about performance, even with the little that they have? Maybe there are lessons that we can learn from other jurisdictions. Thank you very much, Vimba.